on. I think our mic should still be working as expected. Good. Sounds like it is. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about computer science. This is the sort of what I'm supposed to be talking about, but what I'm really going to be talking about mostly is software engineering. So I put both on the title page, but really this is going to delve into software engineering, mostly computer science. We'll explain how it relates to it, um, but not so much the emphasis. Um, my name is Dana Farrell. I'm on Red Hat's software defined networking team, is what SDN stands for. We're not going to be getting into the nitty gritty details of that, which is what I normally give talks about all over the world, which is a fun thing that we'll talk about later about why you should be a software engineer. Um, but we will uh, kind of highlight a few aspects of that before we drive into the talk. Uh, things that I've done with my degree so far. So I'm a lead, a project technical lead of um, the integration packaging project in Open Daylight, which you don't need to know what it is, of course, but it involves things we'll talk about in a second, DevOps tools, delivery pipelines. I uh, do a lot of test work uh, for the same open source project. I'm also do a lot of performance testing work for a different open source project called OPNFE, Open Platform for Network Function Virtualization, uh, which is also open source, of course. I do some governance things, so I'm on a technical steering committee, which is basically the sort of way that we organize leadership in open source communities. Um, so that's me. Let's see a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today, uh, from a high level view, and then we'll dive right in. So first, I'll kind of give a little bit about my journey and give you a funny story about how I became a software engineer. I'll then give a very quick overview of what software engineering is, its definition, how it relates to some common terms, which I think teases it out maybe more than its definition. Um, we'll go into some examples of different types of software engineering, different jobs that you can do with software engineering, uh, sort of skill sets and desires, I guess. Um, I'll then feed some Kool-Aid to you. I'll be very upfront about my Kool-Aid, but I'll tell you some of my favorite parts of the job and some conclusions about why I think it's a cool job. Okay, so how I became a software engineer, my journey to this job. So, you know, I see a lot of kids and uh, families, I guess, in this room. So, well, hopefully this is a really positive experience for all the parents, too. But uh, when I was in K-12, when I was in the 12 end of K-12, I was applying for universities. Uh, I knew that I really had a, a strong passion for biology and medicine. I kind of had thoughts about maybe being a doctor or something in the future. Uh, I was sitting in front of NC State's um, interface or whatever, the, the main portal for sending applications, and I had this big list in front of me of different types of engineering. I knew I wanted to do engineering, and there was like, I don't know, 30 or 40 different types of engineering that I could have majored in. And I had no background at all in what engineering is or what computer science is. My dad is you know, well educated and stuff, but he has a totally different domain. So I had no one sort of grew up in this space to teach me the difference between these things. Um, so I largely arbitrarily just sort of went biology and medicine, um, bio, I, I like those two things in general. How about biomedical engineering? And went with that. And it turned out okay because it turns out at NC State, the first two years or so of your engineering degree program is about the same. Um, between engineering majors, and it's pretty easy to change majors, at least uh, during that time period. So I you know, eventually came to university and, and uh, was doing this biomedical program and staying up really late at night working, and eventually started working on things that weren't quite what I expected. So I, I discovered Linux about this time, 2007, which is a free open source operating system which you should look at. Um, and I started having thoughts like this. I, I, all right, I, I have this interesting biomedical work. It's like it's kind of cool. It's kind of interesting, but I'm having trouble forcing myself to go do that. What I really want to go do, what I'm sort of being distracted to go do, is hack in this Linux dark world of virtual machines and editors and strange programming languages and things like that. Um, so I have a passion for this. If I'm easy, if I find it easy to go spend my time on this. Um, hey, maybe I should just major in this. It turns out there's a degree for this. Um, so that degree is called computer science. I changed from biomedical engineering to computer science, which is one of the best decisions I've made in my lifetime. Um, I then went on, probably the most important thing I did at university was that I led the NCSU IEEE um, robotics team, ground robotics team here, and that was just ridiculous as far as experience goes and sort of actual usable skill sets and things that contribute to jobs and stuff. I mean, the rest of the university was important. This was more important than all the rest of it combined. Um, I did some internships early in the software-defined networking field, which is a, it's a big paradigm shift thing. Again, we're not going to get into it. But I got into that like really strangely early, which was lucky. Um, I also, so the robotics plus uh, stuff was, was, sorry, the robotics work was great training for open source, and I was in, in open source spaces. So that plus SDN implied that Red Hat hired me. 
Um, they hired me into the CTO office, which is doing research and development things. Um, so that's really fun. I have a lot more flexibility uh, because of that. So cool. So software engineers, uh, we've talked about this a lot. Let's, let's get into the definition. It's pretty straightforward. If on the face of it, we create software. Uh, by create, I mean a lot of things. So there's the designing part of the creation. There's the developing, actually typing it out creation. There's testing it in many different ways to validate that it works. Um, there's this maintenance process that happens. And each of these breaks down into many other types of work. Uh, and software, what I mean by software, everything. And the world is being eaten by software. I'll probably say this more throughout the talk. Uh, but everything is running on software, so there's software in every type of device and every level of abstraction from really close to the hardware to these incredibly nebulous ideas around cloud infrastructure and stuff, and you can work at every level of abstraction in every part of the world. Um, we totally ignore this definition of engineering, so I, I think there's not a lot of other you know, proper engineers giving talks today, but if, if, they, if there are, then they'll very frequently cite engineer is directly equivalent to having a certified engineering certificate thing. Um, we don't do that in software engineering world. There's no such thing as like a certified software engineer. Um, we do relate to other types of engineering in this sense. That we Primarily in the sense that we build on the work that's done by electrical engineers and electrical and computer engineers. That they create our sort of microchips and architectures and the hardware that we run on. And then we write software to run on that hardware. <clears throat> they may also be responsible for some low level software. Uh, so I know there's a sort of emphasis on robotics today, so I thought I would describe where we relate to uh, robotics and sort of the creation stack. We typically build robotics teams with electrical engineers and uh, that are responsible for sort of the batteries and the wiring and the servos and just all the electrical components on the robot and making them wire together and move properly and have enough power and have the right voltages and not catch on fire and things like that. Um, we also have mechanical engineers who sort of 3D print those arms or put the connecting devices together and your extruded aluminum kits so that you can build the chassis of your robot properly and things like that. Um, do a 3D modeling of your robot. And then you have computer scientists or software engineers who write all the code, who make the actuators move, who write the localization algorithms for figuring out where the robot is on the course, or the navigation algorithms for how to move to somewhere else on the course, or the computer vision algorithms for taking in that sensory input and doing something useful with it. Uh, so that's kind of where we fit in that stack. I think it's useful to talk about software engineering as it relates to some other keywords or key ideas, especially uh, as it relates to computer science. So I think this is, I didn't understand this, um, even when I was in the early parts of the degree. I think they're young students in the degree program that don't understand this now, so definitely worth teasing out. Um, software engineering versus computer science. First, let's talk about science versus engineering. So science is sort of the study of the physical world, the study of the natural world, um, trying to understand that. Engineering is building on that understanding, that correct understanding of the physical world to do something useful with it, to, to try to implement something, to try to build something, to try to create some physical manifestation. Um, so as an example, computer science brought us the Turing machine, which is this abstract description of a computer as a piece of tape with a head on it. You can write via the head under the tape and move the tape back and forth for infinity. And with this very simple machine, you can describe everything that's computable, and you can do all these thought experiments about whether something's computable or not computable. And this is very important for the fundamentals of computer science, obviously. Um, Whereas with software engi engineering, we would, or with engineering, not software engineering, we would create the CPUs or the, the microarchitectures and such that do the, the Turing machine, except in more efficient ways, right? That um, can do this sort of tape thing, except in gigahertz scales instead of very slow tapes moving in theory. Um, computer science would bring us things like graph theory, so we would have a set of nodes and how to traverse the nodes, the shortest path along these nodes, and the paths out of weights. How about we need to talk about the batteries? All right, I'll just talk about it. I probably don't need one this screen here. So if the if the graphs just have weight of one, then that's you know the shortest uh, path traversal or a weighted path traversal. You can get all these complicated, fun algorithms on how to do graph theory, uh, and that's computer science. That's an observation about the natural world and how it works. Software engineering would bring us things like Google Maps, where we take these ideas and we lots of very complicated algorithms and distributed systems running in software at scale with lots of different real world inputs and internet of things devices and your phone reporting information back to it and this complicated thing that we built in software engineering. 
Um, so you can do pure CS, you can get a degree in just computer science and then just do computer science. We frequently do that in academia. Um, there's other places to do that, it's, it's a very big world. Um, but the vast majority of people get a CS degree and then go on to do something else that's not called CS. They typically go on to do something called software engineering, which typically involves using the abstractions that we built in CS to build things. Okay, so how does software engineering relate to the term developer? This is clear. Developer is basically engineer. At least in this talk, when I say developer, you can just easily say engineer. There are a few sort of conventions. Uh, so yeah, one convention being that software engineer and software developer are the same. Another convention being that you would not normally say the word web engineer. That sounds weird to people about developers, so it's normally say that. But, but this is not important in these conventions. Um, so let's see some examples of different types of software engineering work. So the first one, and these are all going to be quick, because there's like maybe seven or eight of these. Feel free to jump in with questions, in particular in this section. I think this is a good place to go. Um, so web, um, web developers, not web engineers, they build web-based content. So we're all familiar with this, including this page. There's the front end aspect of this, which can be the website that you see, the HTML, the CSS, and JavaScript is running in your browser. There's a back-end component to this, which is what's running off on servers remotely somewhere. These are things like the databases that know your password and put a hash of your passwords so you can actually log in. Some back-end programming languages like Ruby and Python to run applications on the server so you can do things with that data and the requests you're making of it. Uh, the Linux servers themselves that need to be provisioned and you need to not care about them and you don't just destroy them and rebuild them very quickly and things like that. Um, so that's a, again super, super brief introduction to what, what this type of engineering does, web developers. Not at all trying to be exhaustive here. So lots of asterisks are not covering everything that could be covered here. Um, mobile developers. So we create user mobile developers create user facing applications on mobile devices. There's also uh, the mobile device to an operating system itself, which is not the same thing as this. We'll talk about that in the kernel developer section. Um, these are user facing aspects that you like hit icons and things load. Um, so they typically do their work with what are called SDKs, or software development kits. And so there's this pre-built set of tools for building applications for Android and iOS. And you become very familiar and proficient with these SDKs, and you get really good at creating apps. Um, so that's kind of their, their world is largely around these SDKs and tooling associated with them. This can include programming languages like C++ for iOS, or Java for Android, uh, simulated phones. You don't have to have three of your phones in your closet. You can simulate different screen sizes and types of hardware and make sure that the applications work well. Um, there's an emphasis on aesthetic and design, visual aesthetic and design, in, uh, in this particular type of engineering. Uh, it's there in other places, and you can sort of emphasize this more or less in these other domains, but it's typically emphasized more in this uh, Embedded engineers, uh, or developers. So by embedded, I mean code running close to hardware, right? So when we talk about close or layers. We use these terms a lot and maybe I should take a second to describe them. But when we say sort of higher layers or lower layers in this software engineering speak, we mean how close it is to the hardware, right? So if it's sort of responsible for bit twiddling in the CPU and like literally moving RAM into the CPU and then adding some number, a number from RAM into the CPU and adding something together and then moving it back into RAM and then moving that to your hard drive, that is super low level of code, right? You could not write a big complicated game by doing it that way. That would be very, very tedious. Um, so if you want to build abstractions on that, so it's a little code, you have something that can say, hey, create a figure on a game map, or hey, create this beautiful game world. And you can do that in the set of abstractions and these layers. So they create the lowest layer code, typically. Um, this could be things like the sort of firmware for common devices that we interact with, like our very products and network interfaces. Um, they could be fun things like robots, you all in the club, um, that's, that's typically embedded in development. Or we touched on inter IoT or Internet of Things uh, in the last talk, um, like you with smart cars and things like that. Uh, so that's a huge and growing domain. It's, it's a buzzword, but it's also a growing domain. Uh, so lots and lots of future embedded work to be done there. Um, Work in embedded languages is typically done in low-level things like assembly. Maybe that's even lower than they sometimes touch on. C is very common. The background of Linux is critical in all of these. So it's probably going to be a lot. You get, I, I 
I have this fun argument in a talk that I do about why you can do uh, robotics development in higher level languages of Python and why it's a good idea. We don't have time for that today, but I, I intentionally put Python on this embedded uh, slide to kind of pro people who think that you have to do Another type of engineering, game developers. So you probably all know what these are. Game developers create games. They typically use frameworks kind of similar to the mobile app developers where there's lots of prepackaged tools to build these things because they're very hard to build the constituent parts of. You would not want to draw your, you create your own vector, vector drawing uh, library and things like that for 2D and 3D and make it high performance. You want to reuse things people have already created to get you know, value from that and, and add value in some useful way yourself instead of duplicating that. Uh, so, in particular, all of these are underpinned by, by sort of theoretical foundations. This one's underpinned very quickly by theoretical foundations, which is mathematics. Um, so you're kind of touching that maybe more than average. Testing engineers, test engineers. So test engineers very basically validate software. There's lots of different types of validation. This is near and dear to my heart, so I can talk about this quickly. I think it's probably near and dear to all software engineers' heart apps, actually. New software engineers may be sort of undervalued test engineers, but there's some sort of relationship between the amount of experience you have and how much you love test engineers. They save you so much. It's probably the most loved type of engineers. Um, so functionality testing, does it actually work when we run sort of basic testing and of validate? No, it does what we think it should. I think it does. Performance testing, how well does it work? Can we scale to big, uh, how well does it perform? Can we scale to big numbers of users or big numbers of nodes and instances, uh, things like that? Usability is this, you know, can we put this in front of a set of people who have never seen it before and watch what happens and, and, and maybe put the dev in the room if you really want to torture them and watch the weird flows and figure out how to move through the software. Oh, and then they see this is terribly unusable, this fails this usability test, and then figure out how to do X, Y, and Z at some point in time. Security testing, so this is a really fun one, I think. Uh, there's, a, there's a job, all young people should pay attention to this one. There's a job called a penetration tester basically means that they pay you a couple hundred thousand dollars a year to hack into banks, physically or in software or other things that can be hacked into, and then tell them how you hacked into it and report back, here's the vulnerabilities that we found, here's how you can fix them, please go back and fix them, we'll be back in a year to try to hack you again. Um, really, really amazing job, totally exists, security engineers, things like that. They also do auditing, generic sort of automated auditing of big software systems for all vulnerabilities. Um, these things are layers, right? So there's different types of tests like we just talked about that are happening in different layers of abstraction. They're all happening in automated ways and constantly open against advantages of the so network engineers, we're going to another type. This is um, this is kind of a changing space. So it's, a lot of the terms here are going to be this is changing into something else. So a little bit of flux about what's going on here. In general, this is about making the internet work, about making networks work and data flow between them. Uh, there's there's kind of the logic of how data flows over this network. That's one aspect of this. And then there's a little, I'm trying not to geek out into software-defined networking, which is what we're touching on. I want to explain this. So, so logic of how data flows. Um, that used to be done with distributed routing protocols. So you may be familiar with terms like algorithms like BGP, very famous routing protocol for determining how data flows in some sort of distributed consensus way. Uh, there's a change in how we're doing that now to a more centralized way um, called SDN, with prominent open source projects like Open Daylight and Oven OVN. Um, that also involves a shift from doing specialized hardware to vendor specific proprietary hardware to common software that can run in sort of its body servers. Uh, this is a general move in this space about moving from hardware to virtualized things that are more generic and easier to re implement and easier to open source and less easy for Cisco and some other vendors to adopt them into. Um, so this is a probably not here, so controversial. But if I did, I wouldn't do this this deck, this particular set of slides at like LinuxCon because there's too much, too many asterisks in these. But we'll, we'll acknowledge the asterisks and then move quickly through them. Another type of engineering involves sys sys admins or DevOps these people. These people basically manage infrastructure. Um, so this involves we, we we now we as a company now have instead of our sort of one server in our closet, we've got our round of funding with $100 million in our last round, we really need to drastically expand our set of infrastructure. Oh no, we can't scale from one server in the closet to the big infrastructure requirements that we have. 
How do we do that? We bring in someone who knows about managing infrastructure, who knows how to stand up lots of servers and provision them in automated ways. They don't have to do this manually all the time. So a set of skills that's super important and demanding on um, the Verizon cloud and the data centers and things like that. So this DevOps and there's an asterisk. Basically what I mean by this uh, is, is around automating everything. There's a philosophy of automating everything, treating your infrastructure as code. And so if you, you have sort of the manual, I log into the server and I do this configuration stuff and I, I set up my Apache um, process running and all of this stuff, then that's that's sort of bad, right? Those are manual configuration steps. There should be code that you are writing and checking into version control that does all this and automated this for you. That's kind of one of the tenets of this. There's also, which is why this asterisk is here, there's a, there's a philosophy too behind DevOps around the integration of ops and dev people in companies. Totally irrelevant for this, I'm not going to get into that at all. I just wanted to, to throw that out there so you don't quote me. Um, in general, it's about this process. I'll make this really quickly. So, code changes, and calls tests to run, and calls release artifacts to build, calls more tests to run, and calls releases to be published. We have this cycle really quickly. So, the developers see their code running in production quickly in automated ways, and there's no blockers in between them, and their code actually getting in. So, there are bug fixes and stuff that some of the other niche engineering things that I'm just going to talk about super briefly. So they're important, but there's not that many people who do them. Uh, I tried to sort of pick types of engineering that are common by numbers um, to highlight. So examples include things like programming language creation. So actually going out and writing some of the really fundamental tools like Java, or Ruby, or Python that we use to do other things. The programming languages that we use, and the compilers that run them. Uh, the operating system, the things that are running on your phone, that's Linux basically, the things that are running on your laptops, it's iOS or Windows or Linux. Uh, creating the fundamentals of those, not the user facing parts, but sort of the parts that deal with the hardware, nitty gritty, very complicated schedulers and things like that. Um, that's a really small but awesome group of people, um, operating system kernel developers. Security people, we talked about penetration testing, auditing, things like that. Uh, I went on a tangent for that one. So, cool, moving out of one section, I'm going to take a few seconds to read and all the questions. And we're moving into our conclusions now. Okay, cool. So some of my favorite parts of software engineering. I work for Red Hat, which is super focused on open source historically, and it's sort of not random that I work for Red Hat. I have a big passion for open source. I've been doing this stuff for a long time. Uh, so my very favorite part overall is, is, is working in open source. In particular, there's the development method, right, is, is what's so cool about it to me. Um, it's a globally distributed, decentralized way of creating software in the open. We don't have these, oh, I'm a vendor and I've created my set of software and there's some other vendor and you've created your set of software and oh, now we can make them work together because the customer wants them to work together. So let's sign our NDAs and spend a year trying to not leak secrets. No, all the code is available and so we can go do our integration activity because uh, in the public, because all the code is publicly accessible in the internet. Drastically speeds up the development cycle, it makes it way more fun. Um, huge, huge thing in the last decade, but really, particularly the last couple of years, it's still really fun. I know that. The communities and open source are also really amazing. The people you work with are brilliant. Um, you get to travel all over the world, um, and a lot of conferences. Talk to them. It's a very good way to learn quickly about spaces and ideas and things that have a uh, This is a creative activity. You literally create something. Something comes out of this, right? There's a creative process at the end of which there's an artifact that is interesting. Um, this, is, this is fun. We don't always do this in sort of very spaces. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of lasting important impacts in this space, too. So we're, again, we're creating these artifacts that, even if they go away, they at least taught us about how to solve this problem. They, they may be used in a building block in some future thing, which has been used in a building block in some future thing. If you've ever done a lot of science fiction reading, right? You, you read about the future in a thousand years, ten thousand years or something, and all these incredibly strong AI systems exist, and these amazing pieces of software, they're all underpinned by the sort of foundational software that we're building now, right? Like, they're still using the basic compilers, the GCCs of the world, the software, the pieces of software are still running these things. So if we continue to exist as a species, parts of these software will run forever, right? Like, this, is, this does have a lasting impact. There's also things like, I, I love this example, right? So the, 
whole data center cloud space right now, most of the, a lot of the money being made on that is how to make it more efficient because the big cost is power, right? So you have all these servers running and you have to cool them. The vast majority of the cost in the data center is that cooling and that power cost. So if you want to make data centers cheaper, you're trying to make them consume less power, so you're trying to make them more green, basically. And we're doing that in software, so we're mitigating significant impacts in the environment just by writing the software. Um, there's, there's all kinds of sort of standard good benefits of being a software engineer. It's super flexible. You can work from anywhere in the world, especially in open source communities. It's a requirement to work from anywhere in the world because the teams are globally distributed, so time zones, so time doesn't matter. Um, location doesn't matter. Money is, is really good. Six figure job, it's our first job. It's not a terrible problem. Um, this is a great space, super in demand right now. We've hired 2,000 people since I started working here at that. It's exploded. Um, touch on travel, I, I am fortunate working in the CPU office that we have budget for this. But in general, conferences and, and talking at conferences are a huge, fun part of software engineering in this space. You get to interact with, with pros from all over the world. Uh, giving the talks themselves can be really fun. You get a lot of pulling around and things. I, I was in uh, Denver last week. I'm going to Madrid on Monday. I'm going to Berlin the week after that. And it's, it's crazy. So, so again, two quick conclusions. Software is eating the world. Everything is going to be dominated by software. It's a good space to be in. This is an engaging, creative, well-rewarded job. Well-rewarded in many ways. Uh, Skills, so, a few sort of advice type moments. So skills to build, I, I really think the two most important skills in software engineering are critical thinking, being able to sort of dissect the problem based on what evidence you actually have and reason about it. Um, and then communication, being able to talk about that. Especially written communication, I mean, in special forms, verbal communication is obviously important, but the vast majority of the work in these communities happens via email, happens via documentation, and comments, happens via IRC messages, and clearly and succinctly describing what you want in a written way, super underrated as far as importance of software engineering. Math, yeah, okay, everyone knows math is important, but I think it's stereotypically important. Um, this is another really important thing that I would like to highlight, so especially the parents in the room. Um, the most important thing in this space is having sort of this self-drive to learn, right? So getting a degree is important, maybe. You know, you need this undergrad degree, Getting more advanced degrees, it's, it's like, okay, sort of, if that's how you learn best, maybe that's important, but the title behind that degree, not so important anymore. It's really becoming about sort of your ability to self-motivate yourself to, to go out and learn these new skills, because there just aren't going to be able to keep up with this in university, right? I mean, in my advanced graduate level networking classes, we had one line about software by networking, which is we're not going to learn software by networking. A lot of these very newest things are just too new for universities. So you have to learn the fundamentals for these underpinnings of computer science, the Turing machine type ideas of the world, and computer science uh, degrees, and then you have to go out on your own and learn these sort of newer technologies that are changing constantly. So it's more important to learn the sort of skill set around self-motivated self learning, less important to learn the specific computer science skills. Let me add like two more slides and then I'll take one of the most important, if you look at the studies around why people enjoy jobs or not, it's because they get to form the job into the sort of something that they like. There's a lot of room for doing that in software engineering. You can shape the job and then it's super easy. Give my kind of information. I think I'm low on time. I have at least one question for you. Uh, your certification would be compared to the degree part of the certification. Certification? Uh, I think it's, it, it compares to so like a Cisco certified network engineer is a, is a famous type of certification that you can get to say that you understand certain types of protocols and how they interact together, for example. That can be really useful um, in two ways. If you're actually doing it to learn things, like if you if this is an effective course that you're going out to learn skills and you plan on using, that's excellent. If you're doing it for the title, that can be useful to sneak past HR people. It's not very useful for actually getting the job beyond that. Um, good for step one, getting across HR, not so good for the engineers that need the job. Yes? What are some of your recommendations? Um, there's some really excellent, super good uh, courses that have come out in the last two years, sort of these online uh, 
case, but really what you're looking for is something that gets you typing. So Code School is a good example, but it, it's, it's these courses, right, that are teaching you content, but then they have you quickly do examples as part of this. So in the browser, you're typing code, and I think that's absolutely critical for learning the program in particular, um, is getting typing to the typing phase as soon as possible. Don't just sit there and read a book for two weeks before you start typing any code. Read as little as you can and start typing code immediately. Uh, that's what you're Any other questions? Otherwise, I believe I'm out of time. Thank you all.